Why, yes, I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> Live from Little Rock, it's Shane Plays Radio, Geek Talk Radio, a journey into the things we love. I'm your host, Shane Stacks. Thanks so much for joining us and listening, whether you're listening live uh, in Central Ar- Arkansas, or you know that, uh, Zach, you know that uh, Arkansas is a pirate's favorite state, right? Arkansas. I had, I had to cover up a blunder with a bad joke. So um, anyway, you know, their, their favorite actor is Peter Skarsgård. I got that from an old... Saturday Night Live skit. Anyway, all right. So thanks so much for listening, whether you're listening live in Central Arkansas on 96.5 FM, The Answer, or if you're listening via the live stream via the 96.5 FM, The Answer.com website. Uh, thanks so much if you're listening via the podcast, uh, or if you're listening on Krypton Radio a week delayed. Also, we're welcome that you're, we're welcome when we're glad you're here, no matter how you're listening, whether live or pre recorded. So I'm going to throw out a quick, uh, housekeeping notes here and then i'll introduce my guest and then we'll have the ever popular and usually somewhat tragic news segment so let's see here how this is going to go all right first of all don't forget that we always have show notes for the show at shaneplays.com and that's like plays like i like to play not like it's my place so s-h-a-n-e-p-l-a-y-s.com so if you want to know more about the news items we're talking about today or if you want to know more about my guest who is super cool uh, then go there, shameplays.com. Uh, and the show will go out in the next two or three days, usually. Uh, you, Thursday at the latest, but I usually try to get it out by Monday or Tuesday. That'll go out on the blog at shameplays.com. It'll go out on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, other fine, fine podcast uh, directories. I also put it up on YouTube, just the audio. Uh, a lot of people listen to it on YouTube that way. Uh, sometimes more people listen to it on YouTube than the actual podcast. just depends on the guest. And how the word gets out. But anyway, uh, yeah, that's uh, youtube.com slash go shame plays. And that's linked, you know, on the website. And I'll, I'll put links and all that stuff there. Uh, last, we are carried a week delayed on Krypton Radio. Krypton Radio is sci fi for your Wi Fi. Kryptonradio.com. Last, this is, well, I think I said last. So last, last, P.S., this is Geek Talk Radio. It's, it's not just a podcast. There's nothing wrong with a podcast. I love podcasts. But this is actual talk radio, just like political talk radio or sports talk radio or religious talk radio or, hey, my plant's dying. How do I save it? Talk, whatever. All the, It's geek talk radio. I don't know of any other show like it. So uh, thanks, thanks so much for listening in. But the reason I say all that is... You know, you can call in at 501-823-0965. That's 501-823-0965. Or you can tweet me at ShanePlays, S-H-A-N-E-P-L-A-Y-S. Sometimes we get callers and comments. Sometimes we don't. Either way, it's always a great show. I just want you to know you're welcome to do that. Okay, finally, I figure, I've figured i finished all that. I want to introduce my guest, who I've been following online for quite a while, and I'm super excited to have on. I've got John Peterson, who is... A Dungeons and Dragons and role playing game historian slash scholar, and he also wrote a really cool book called Playing at the World. So, John, welcome to Shane Plays. Well, thanks so much for having me, Shane. Yeah, you have no idea how excited I am to be talking to you. you I don't know anybody else that's doing the level of research and um, documentation of the history of role playing games as you. The, the closest it comes is Michael Whitwer and his biography on Gary Gygax, but that was more of a biography on Gary Gygax, not a really in-depth research on where did all these role-playing games come from and how can we document. So, you know, in in your blog is fascinating. Uh, My only complaint is that uh, because you do such a thorough job of researching, you know, you're not posting willy-nilly like every day or something like that. So I always, I always look forward to those little nuggets. Yeah, I mean, I've contemplated doing something where I put up like every week some picture of this or that to try to show people, hey, like, you know, like like a throwback Thursday <laughs> or right. sort of thing. Okay. Well, yeah, no um, pun intended, throwback. Throw them dice. I'm yeah, sorry. Right. That's the way my brain yep. works. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do uh, a news segment. When we finish the news segment, we'll talk about uh, about what you do and about your book and about your blog and all that stuff. Uh, okay. I've I, you know, we'd hit this real quick and feel free to comment 
uh, d- during the news segment. I love it when my guests do because sometimes it stuff comes up I didn't I wouldn't have even thought of. So please feel free. Um, huh. All right, okay. Zach, can you fire up the microphone there in the in the newsroom? See if those guys and gals are working. Up oh, there they are. Oh, working hard. Man, love that typewriter sound. Okay, folks, remember, for every dollar of support that the show gets via Patreon, the news staff gets a penny an hour raise. That's huge. Or as, or as a certain candidate would say right now, that's huge. So, uh, you know, help these folks. And folks, also, I have sponsors for this show, and I'm super, super pleased and blessed to have them. But to be quite honest, they don't cover all the costs. I mean, an actual radio show broadcasting over the airwaves coming out of a radio studio, it costs a whole lot more than a podcast. Uh, So, you know, if if you like the show, now I'm not saying, hey, donate or it's going away. I don't want to I don't want to misrepresent that. But uh, I do cover a lot of the cost of the show out of my own pocket because it's a passion for me and I love doing it. And I get to talk to cool people like John. And then you guys get to hear the cool discussions with people like John. Uh, but if, if you like the show, you know, please consider uh, donating as little as a dollar an episode via Patreon. And it's patreon.com slash shameplace. Okay, I haven't really pitched that in a while, so I thought I'd throw out there. But we're going to move on. All right, here we go with the news items. Uh, and <laughs> this one's not really geeky, but it just grabbed my attention. Okay, so this is via Global News Canada. John, did you see this where a man tried to rob a store with a sword and the clerk pulled out a sword and chased him off? Well, it wasn't just a sword. It was a scimitar, right? The, yeah. the, the guy behind the counter had a scimitar. It was literally nope. a scimitar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wonder yeah. who rolled initiative on that. It looks like the clerk because he chased him off. Did you see? Did you hear about this, Zach? No, I did not. Okay. So this was in Toronto. Yeah. And it was like basically kind of like a convenience store. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, in the bigger cities, you have basically convenience stores that are not gas stations. Yeah. Like for us here... In Arkansas, every convenience store is also a gas station. Well, right. here you got these little corner stores all mm-hmm. over the place in larger cities. So the video, this the surveillance video shows a couple of guys going into the store. One of them pulls out, they, they say it's a machete, but it's a very large knife or a small sword or something like that. The clerk takes one look and pulls out this huge, like, Sinbad scimitar <laughs> and chases them off. It's great. Yeah, they That's go awesome. Run, they go running off, and then they're interviewing him later, and he goes, yeah, if that didn't work, I had this too, and he pulled a pistol out of his out of his back belt. Whoa. Yeah, so these guys were not going to get anything. But the, the footage, like the interview shows the owner saying, you know, these guys, y'all, y'all just need to find a job. This is no life to live, and he's like kind of scolding them. So anyway, all right, before I move on, any, any, any thoughts on this, John? I mean, again, uh, don't bring a knife to a scimitar fight. That's, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. No, wiser words have rarely been spoken. So anyway, that link is up on shameplays.com. Next, and this the, the actual date is somewhat disputed, uh, but I'm going to go with the, 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 the date that uh, CNET went with. August 23rd, 1991 was basically the 25th anniversary of the World Wide Web. Now, not the Internet. The internet, which the World Wide Web is on, but is not the entire internet. World Wide Web is just a protocol that we use to use the internet. Is 25 years old. On August 23rd, 1991, 25 years ago, is the day that it was opened up to the public. So a few days before that, the very first web page went up, but that was only available to uh, employees at CERN, C-E-R-N, in Switzerland. And, of course, the Internet's been around itself among colleges and military institutions since the 60s. So, but that's, that's pretty big stuff. Uh, I mean, you know, I've always been a huge Internet guy. I make my, my career. I do, I do websites. Yeah. You know, so, so that's big for me. Mm-hmm. And to think, to think everything it does in just 25 years. 25 years is a relatively short period of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, John is on the show right now via Skype. Right. So, right. yeah, I mean, it's, just, it's mind blowing. There's literally like I, I was fortunate. I was born in in 72. So I got to see the pre-internet world and I got to see the post-internet world. And the change has been absolutely drastic. If you have if you didn't actually see before and after, it's hard to grasp how different things are. So and, and then, John, you know, you like your blog that all that that fascinating stuff you put on your blog. I would not be able to read that without the internet and 
And I want to give uh, credit to Tim Dur- Tim Berners Lee, who is now I think he's been knighted. Uh, he purposefully made it a open, free protocol because he knew yeah. that was the best way it could. Go. So that that was an amazing thing that he did. Because I mean, he and, could have. Uh, go ahead, John. No, I was just going to say. I mean, the the transformation this has had, even for you know this small part of the world that, that right. I study, the the fan communities, right? What it used to be like in the '60s and '70s, where you used to have to manually print these fanzines, and right. you would print out you know 40, 100 copies of them, send them to some friends, to some people you met at conventions, and that was the extent of the hobby. The the way that the web transformed the hobby, and this began because I mean a lot of the people who are you know game geeks were also computer geeks, right? In the in the late '70s and early '80s, it got kind of faster to our hobby than it did to, to other places. Right. Um, but the disruption it's had just in the ability of people to socialize these ideas, to get them in front of someone you could never have expected was so radically transformed by this. And it's been a great boon to the hobby. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's the internet is just radical in ways I still don't think we quite grasp. We're going to have to have a couple of generations of people who are born into a completely internet society with no preconceived no- notions to really even see more potential that we haven't even realized yet. So it's, it's pretty, pretty wild. Um, and of course, now it's becoming the Internet of Things where your home thermostat, you're this, you're that, it's all connected. So just crazy. Um, all right, just for the purposes of time, I'm going to move us on. Uh, the never ending story uh, due to the Fathom Events company, you know, they do in theater events. The never ending story, if you're a fan of the, of the movie and want to see it in the theater again, or if you've never seen it and would like to see it, do, uh, with Fathom Events, it's going to be in theaters September 4th and 7th. So um, check that out. And uh, it, the price on that is going to be $9.25. So if people want to go check that out. And Fathom Events does some pretty neat stuff, which leads me into my next uh, uh, story, which is, uh, I would assume this is interesting for you, John, since you track the historical progress of role-playing games in the community, they are Fathom Events is live broadcasting on September 4th. You can go to the movie theater and right, watch yeah. people play Dungeons and Dragons out of out of PAX West. So Chris Perkins and the Acquisitions Incorporated crew, they already live stream it online. Uh, but now people can literally go to the theater, pay a ticket and sit there in the theater and watch on the big screen. People play Dungeons and Dragons. So is that is that historically remarkable or is it just more of a minor eh, it's kind of neat what's your take on that john Oh, I mean, I think it's really historically remarkable. I mean, but we're seeing a transformation in the our entire games culture around game spectatorship, right? We see this in sites like Twitch. We've seen right. this, um, you know, for, for, for many years now, um, more in the video game culture. I think what we're seeing now is how much that bleeds over into the tabletop culture as well and how fascinated people are with that. Acquisition Incorporated, obviously, has been a trailblazer in this. But this is equally tied in with things like Critical Role and actually with something um, that I found not that long ago that I did a blog post about. Out, which is even in the early 80s, TSR was experimenting with ways I, I to try to show I have that as a news people. item. I've been saving that as a news oh, item. Great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that, the link is actually on the web on the website. I want to talk about that more when we uh, you know, go more into your part of the show. But yeah, they actually had a, uh, where they were dramatizing live, like they were, it sounded like they were taking notes of yeah. live play and then dramatizing it. And they were going to try to make a continuing radio series out of it. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, and you can see that it's like the distant ancestor, right, of what we're right. starting to see today. You can go into a movie theater to watch people play d d It has to be a historical event. All right. So do you think, from what you understand of fandom and history and the community, do you think that this is going to be a success? Or is there just no way of knowing yet? Oh, I, I'm not sure uh, I would place any bets on that at this point. I mean, I, right. again, I think it's certainly the concept that people want to participate in these games as spectators, and especially to see celebrities play these games. Right. That's now well established. There's no dispute about that. In terms of whether this particular event is going to be a success or not, I'll be interested to see. Well, I, you know, I've had uh, Chris Perkins on the show a couple of times. He's a super nice guy. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I told him, and I've told others, now I'm not saying he's on the level of impact on role-playing that Gary Gygax is, but he's kind of this era's, in a way, Gary Gygax for how he's raising, you know what I mean? Like pushing uh, D&D, like being sort of the standard barrier or standard carrier, I would say. He's very important to D&D, not just to 
or he's very important to role playing, and not just to Hasbro and not just to Wizards of the Coast in D and D. I mean, he's you know whether he and he sounds like it hasn't really hit him. You know, he's he's he is very much a celebrity within this realm, and and he's an ambassador for role playing. Oh, very much so. Yeah. yeah, he he, as you say, he's perhaps the face of D and D now in a way that Gary was the face of D and D in the late seventies right. and early eighties. And he's also writing and contributing adventures and shaping what the game is. So I'm going to get a final news item in here, and then we're going to cut to a break and come back, and we'll we're going to talk about playing at the world and what you do. Uh, but uh, speaking of Dungeons and Dragons and where we're at, where we're at historically, uh, evidently, five fifth edition D and D five E is a sales monster now. I don't know how to interpret this, so I'll throw it out there and people can interpret it however they want, but ddoplayers.com, uh, s- somebody on Twitter asked Mike Merles, they said, do you ever talk about the sales numbers, even in relative terms? And Mike Merles, of course, who's sort of s- uh, in charge of D&D, for want of a better word, for Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast, he said the fifth edition lifetime player's handbook sells. And, you know, keep in mind, fifth edition has been out about a year now, less than a year, a little mm-hmm. over a year. It's already greater yeah. than third edition, 3.5 edition, and fourth edition lifetime sales. And those editions are out for years and years compared to fifth edition. Now, what I don't know what he means by this is if that's combined or just each of them. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. But any, regardless, for the short time, relatively short time the fifth edition's been out, it's selling really, really well. So, uh, you know, it's a good time to be in D&D right now and role-playing in general, in my opinion. We're, we're in what I like to call a renaissance of, of tabletop role-playing games. So. I mean, yeah, and from, from my perspective, um, as somebody who really, I started studying this, I guess, uh, for Sirius in 2006 or so, and yeah. uh, as you mentioned, my book about it came out in 2012, it was like total dumb luck for me, right? right. That suddenly there has been this like tremendous outpouring of interest in this, and that, um, you know, I, 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 I certainly, I really lucked out uh, that I started looking into this at the time that I did, yeah. but, I, but I agree, it's it's strangely successful, and you see uh, the player's handbook for 5th edition having an Amazon sales rank of one. Right. Um, yeah, Amazon. That, sales rank that's yeah. ridiculous yeah it's it's <laughs> really out of control so in a good way i mean i'm glad but i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, take us to a break when we come back let's well, i want to talk more with you john about you know what you do uh as a historian and a scholar and then you know more about your book and, and that sort of thing so i'm gonna throw some love at a sponsor and then zach's gonna take us to a break so this is for SpaCon spa dash c-o-n meanwhile in Hot Springs, SpaCon lands in the Spa City September 23rd through 25th at the Hot Springs Convention Center. Come out and celebrate your love of comics, science fiction, anime, cosplay, gaming, pop culture, and all things entertainment. SpaCon is a full-fledged comic convention complete with celebrity guests, vendors selling their wares, comic book artists, panel discussions, discussions featuring special guests, cosplayers, and so much more. And there's also going to be a lot of organized role-playing, and I will be there. Um, I think I'm actually running Numenera uh, on Sunday at this event. Uh, to find out more about SpaCon, remember that Spa-Con, including a full schedule of guests and events, or to purchase tickets, visit www.spa-con.org. Comic book lovers, visit the wildstars.com today from the mind of author and comic book industry expert michael tierney it's not just a comic book it's a comic book novel the wild stars is sci-fi and so much more learn the explanations behind ufos and space gods this isn't the twilight zone this is the region of the milky way galaxy known as the wild stars we guarantee you've never read anything like it the complete comic book novel took 20 years to tell With one reviewer noting, the story of the Wild Stars stretches ambitiously across space and time, from small town murders to the destruction of planets, with every event given multiple layers of meaning. If you haven't read The Wild Stars, you're missing out. Visit thewildstars.com today. Mega Wars Darknet. The classic online space strategy game has returned, bigger and better than ever before. Scout the universe and claim your empire. Construct, customize, and launch dozens of different starships. Battle thousands of opponents online in a team-based competition leading to the ultimate Battle of the Galaxy. Grab your slot today for the only online game where tactics and strategy still reign supreme. 
Visit MegaWars.net and get options only available in our special pre-sales previews running now. MegaWars.net The die is cast. Plunge into worlds of fantastic adventure where dragons lie. And the undead stalk the shades of your mind's imagines. Where creatures of legend plunder wealth through the horror of their passage. Monsters grim and foul hold the ecstasy of gold and the renown of glory. All this and more awaits you and your friends in the unlimited, fantastic world of the Castles and Crusades role-playing game from Troll Lord Games. Visit your friendly local game store or trolllord.com to get your copy today. A rules-light, adaptable game that has stood the test of time. Twelve years in constant publication with no new additions, Castles and Crusades is the original easy-to-play attribute check system. Join us and unleash your imagination. Visit your friendly local game store or trollord.com to get your copy of castles and crusades today shame plays radio is blessed to have sponsors and we appreciate them very much however did you know that you can also support the show as an individual for as little as one dollar an episode simply go to patreon.com slash shame plays welcome back to shame plays geek talk radio a journey into things we love. Our number is 501-823-0965. That's 501-823-0965. Or you can tweet me at Shane Plays. That's S-H-A-N-E-P-L-A-Y-S. I'm pleased to be joined by uh, my guest, John Peterson, who's a historian slash scholar who researches uh, role-playing games and Dungeons & Dragons and also has written a, a really uh, kind of mind-blowing book called Playing at the World. So, John... Uh, I know you you got here at the beginning of the show and did the news segment, but officially welcome to the show for for your portion uh, as as we talk about what you do. So thanks again for coming on. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. So tell us tell us what you do. Uh, what, what, you know, I, when I tell people, hey, you know, you're a historian slash scholar that focuses on role playing games. Like, how do you see yourself as what you do? Yeah, I mean, I guess I try to study the fan cultures and the game design uh, principles that were discovered in the 1960s, 1970s. And really, I focus, I guess, on the transition between um, prior gaming culture that was largely war gaming, conflict simulation, and how people went beyond that and then started trying to simulate instead of armies and battles, um, people and fantastic adventures and take this into new genres and come up with new ways to make the story that these games tell a compelling story for the people that sit down around the table. Okay, so how, how did you get into this? Um, right. So the, the typical story I tell, and this story I think is, is largely true. Being in a story, I always have to question even my own right. uh, even attitudes. Your own but, retention, yeah, um, in 2005, I'd been playing a lot of uh, World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft had, had just come out in uh, November of the previous year. And around February, I was with some friends in London, and I was at the British Museum. And I saw at the British Museum one of these first century AD Roman 20-sided dice. Maybe if you follow things online, you will have seen pictures mm-hmm. of these people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. People circulate them sometimes. Um, but I, I saw one of these in, in person then, and there's actually a whole set of different um, unusual early dice they had. And since I've been playing a lot of WoW, I just had this moment where I wondered um, how far back everything went. Mm. Okay, if, if 20-sided dice are that old, where, where did like everything come from that makes up what I was playing in, in WoW obsessively um, at the time? And so when I went back, I started reading up about it. And, um, you know, I quickly discovered, there, obviously, there had been a lot of, of uh, literature on the subject of how D&D uh, started and what, if, what its influences were. Um, but I, I guess when I looked through that, I found a lot of, a lot of anecdotes, um, a lot of I was there at the time or I talked to Gary to convention once and this is what he told me. And not a lot of here's a document with a timestamp on it mm-hmm. from like 1970 where Gary said like this or that. Yeah. And this is and, where I see say that you're a scholar because the way you document things is I've never seen anything like it outside of, you know, a university or a museum setting. 
Yeah, I mean, well, it occurred to me that you probably could find the set of documents that told this story. Um, and so I, it took me some time, I guess, to figure out even what those might be or, or how you'd even figure out what they might be. Um, there, were, there were some very famous newsletters. Um, There's one that was called the Domesday Book, for example, that if you Google around for this, even in 2006 or 2007, you'd see people talking about, but it was impossible to get copies. And, you know, I, I just kind of embarked on this crusade to try to find, especially those those new newsletters. The newsletters, because people like Gary uh, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, the co-creators of Dungeons and Dragons in 1974, because they participated in their local gaming groups and in national gaming uh, organizations, fan organizations, largely through these, um, these fanzines, these amateur-produced magazines, identifying and acquiring those was the, the main part of my archival effort. So with the, the approach you have, again, I'm going to overuse this word, is very scholarly. Did you have a background in that or have you just developed that on your own? Or, I mean, where did that come from? Um, well, I, I went to school. Um, so I, I, I did some grad school in English literature, actually, though I, I dropped out. Like, like you, I work in computers um, as my day job. And kind of when I was in graduate school is when the dot-com thing really kind of took off. And I got sucked into that. And so... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly have some background, but I'm 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 not a, a academic. I'm not a professor uh, okay. at the moment, at least. And, I, I have um, to admit, I assumed you were. You know, just by the way you approach things. Well, I, I lecture a lot in academia about this these days. Um, in fact, if you have people tuning in from Los Angeles, I'll be lecturing at UCLA on games on uh, October 11th, I believe. Um, nice. So, I mean, I, I, I do this a couple times a year. I did Stanford earlier this year. I've done NYU. I've done a bunch of kind of the games convention uh, conferences, that is, where academics get together to talk about games. So, um, I mean, it, I think there's been a, a, a good response to my work from academia, though, interestingly enough, I'd say that um, – a lot of the academics I talk to are kind of jealous of the purely scholarly approach that I can adopt. Because it's it's difficult to do the kind of work I do in academia. What? Now. <laughs> what? Right. what? You, well, that, you wouldn't think yeah, that. That's you wouldn't think that. But, yeah, but I believe is, you. But... In the sense that when you do history, for example, in academia, usually you have, um, uh, I would say, an ideological um, objective, or at least an affiliation for that history. Okay. And just kind of doing the, what I do instead is I find a text and I say, this is what this text said. And I, yeah. I really just want to establish that, that skeletal framework of here's the things we know happened at this time. That, that kind of work, it's kind of out of fashion. <laughs> so it's like, you're letting the evidence lead the discussion rather than the discussion leading the evidence. I mean, that, that's, that's the um, least generous way to put yeah. it, <laughs> yeah, but, but there is a certain amount of that to it. Yeah, I mean, I, I really do try to find these documents and to tell the story that's in them. Now, now I'm not so naive that I don't think there's some uh, editorial bias necessarily, sure. right? The things that I've studied before um, help me to pick out the facts I think form an interesting part of the story. And, um, you know, you, you can never avoid that. But, uh, yeah, I, I really do try to just find these documents and, and get straight just the simplest facts. Like, you know, when I started working on this, there was a great deal of confusion in the community about whether Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, they had this group called the Castle and Crusade Society, uh -huh, just right. a small group of medieval wargaming enthusiasts. And a lot of the original work on the Chainmail War Game, which was an ancestor, a direct ancestor to D&D, &D, sure. and Dave Arneson's uh, Blackmore campaign came out of that. And there was, like, confusion about whether it started in like 1970 or 1968, right? There's that's like pretty different... big, yeah, that's, that's actually a fairly significant gap considering well, how it, quickly everything yeah. moved. And, yeah. <laughs> and just being able to answer questions like that, okay, I can find, here's a letter from Gary Gygax from 1970, from March, where he says, I'm going to do this. And, you know, things like that uh, just help us to get the basic historical record straight. Yeah, I wish I knew where, uh, I, I wish I had a copy of Whitworth's book with me. I've got it at home where... I remember he tells about he played basically Blackmore with Dave Arneson and went home and couldn't sleep all night because he was just so, you know, blown away right. by the possibilities of it. And I can't remember what date, you know, it was in the book. I don't know where he ended up putting it at. But um, so you, you mentioned you go to a lot of these conferences with academics. And the, have you happened to run across Matt Barton? Have you talked with him at all? You know, I haven't talked to Matt Barton, actually. Obviously, I'm familiar with his work. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I, I study a bit about the intersection, the very early intersection yeah. of these games with computer games, right? And right. the first adaptations of D&D uh, to computer games. And in fact, I'm working on a number of projects in the moment. One of them is about 
um, computer games in the 1960s, and 1970s alone. Okay. Um, because I, I am fascinated by the overlap in the communities. And oddly enough, a lot of these, these uh, fanzines that I found from the 70s, what you can see in them, these kids who went away to college and found computer systems there and talk a lot about mm-hmm. the first computer games they saw. And so it has this really interesting, like firsthand, almost like reporter, you know, journalistic literature about these early games that I mm-hmm. don't think has really come to light before. And I'm really excited about uh, what kind of possibilities they think will come out of being able to show people what's in that literature. Right. Because as you briefly mentioned before, the a lot of the early computer games were D and D clones or very D and D like because that's what a lot of the games that people were playing. That you know there was a crossover in the communities. So, um, but the reason I mentioned Matt is a lot of people. You know he's got that that great uh, interview show on YouTube, uh, but he's also a professor, like a tenured professor um, in, mm-hmm. in Wisconsin. So I just didn't know if you'd ever had a chance to run across him. He, you know, I can't speak for him, but. You know, he talks a lot about the history of D and D because it's so crucial to uh, a lot of video games. Like WoW, you know, you're talking about you were playing WoW, and that's directly connected to those dice somehow from however far back. Uh, and, right. You know, he and so you know, if you ever get a chance to talk to him, he, you know, he'd, he'd probably want to talk with you. It's just kind of throwing. Oh yeah, out I'd there. love to talk yeah. to him. Yeah, uh, great. I mean, guy. I, I know a lot. You know, again, we, we, the people who do this, we do largely know each other. Like I know Mike Whitmer very well. I correspond right. with him every week. We've been on panels together. I really love his work and his research, and uh, I think it's very complementary to what I do. I, I go out of my, my way to try to help get sources for, for him, and I, I think he does the same for me. So right. So. Uh, you know, you mentioned the the castles and crusade society or a castle and crusade society. You know, one thing that strikes me every time I look at the history of role playing games and D anD D and war gaming is how formal these small groups were. You know what I mean? <laughs> like they'll have it's like five guys that get together a couple of times a week, and they have like newsletters, and they'll have a name, and they'll you know what I mean? They have this incredibly structured organization. And and I wonder, was that more of a sign of the times back then? Was society in some ways more formal, or or was that just the nature of the people that were playing? You know, I, I ponder that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think most of those club structures are actually cloning structures that were created by science fiction fandom. And if you look at the way science fiction fandom was organized in the early 20th century, and this really started, I mean, we, we could get into a whole separate, we'd have a whole show just about what science fiction fandom in the early, right. early 20th century was like. But um, the famous groups like the Futurians and so on, these were small groups of fans of science fiction who organized conventions. Even if they only thought like 12 people were going to show up, they would hold a convention. They had their newsletters, but they, they viewed this as steps towards, I think, um, more fu- formal publication. They they viewed this as kind of um, uh, as training, right, for getting into being a professional writer about science fiction, either as a critic or as as, a, as an author of, of the fiction itself. And so they they you know they created these structures. If you look at who was in the Futurians, these are people who went on to be right. giants of science fiction. And you could say the same for a lot of these small wargaming clubs. These were people who wanted to be able to socialize rules to try to build consensus. And they they targeted the biggest groups they could. But at the time, a lot of these groups were quite small. Right. And for for something like medieval war games, yeah, I mean the the first list we see that lists the membership of the Castle and Crusade Society is in the third issue. It's got like nine people on it. Right. Um, and the group yeah, but yet they are. But yet they're a members. formal society. You know, and it, it's right, just. It right, just right. I'm not making. I'm not mocking them. It just amuses me. You know that they're that serious about it. And you know they'll have like they'll be like the first joint uh, venture between the Castles and Crusade Society and the Chicago. Wargaming, you know, Citadel or whatever, you know, it's 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 so documented, so formal, and this is a bunch of people get together and play games. So I, I don't know, and you know, they'll have ranks like the wargaming, you know, they'll have ranks and all this stuff. But I, I because of that seriousness, we have what we have today. So I'm not mocking it. I, I think it's I think it's great. I would I would kind of actually like to have been there to be quite honest about it. Um, well, and I, I go back to your point about Tim Berners-Lee and the web and, and all that and how different web culture is from this, right? We can't imagine how hard it was to get 
the, that even that group organized, right, when it was all done through the mail, when people are scattered right. across, you know, the Midwest, you could only meet once a year at, at Gen Con or whatever. Um, so we take for granted now that just easy, if you're interested in the same thing, you'll just Google it, you'll find a website, you'll find a forum, start talking. I mean, it was such a different process. You needed these structures well, to get yeah. people together. Then. And to illustrate that, you know, uh, evidently when uh, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson were working together on the first rules of D and D, what became D and D, they had to do everything by letter because long distance phone was too expensive. So yeah, they, right. they weren't even talking <laughs> to Skype, each other. Yeah. yeah, they weren't even talking to each other by phone. So it's a, just a, just a different world. So um, I I don't want to forget. I did have this as a news item. So uh, you know the D and D syndicated radio show pilot from the eighties. What? Mm. How did you get a copy of that? Like, where did you, did, were you looking for it or did it just show up? Or, I mean, how did you find this thing? Yeah, I mean, this, this is an interesting one. We, we knew a lot about uh, some of TSR's experiments with media properties in the early 1980s. Obviously, the, the D&D cartoon show is the one that's very famous. Um, I read a piece, I guess it was last year, about uh, their attempts to make a, a feature film, right? They hired a very famous uh, Hollywood screenwriter, an Academy Award winning screenwriter, to produce a, a feature film script. It never quite got made. Um, and it turned out, I think if you read the script, it, you can see why it never got made. But um, So, it, you, so know, you have the script? Yeah, yeah. And so I, I wrote a piece about this. I could give you a link for it uh, for sure. the show notes if you want. But sure. um, So there are things like that we knew about. But this notion that there was a plan for a syndicated radio show, there were only a couple data points in the fossil record that showed us that that, that was even ever a plan. And yeah, so th this particular tape, it's an audio cassette, um, was found actually in Brian Bloom's collection. Uh, Brian Bloom was one of the principals of TSR, one of the three founders of TSR right. in the 1970s. And he had held on to this for the last uh, 30 years. And, um, you know, I think when it was found, uh, we weren't sure what it was initially. Uh, I think at first it was a cassette. And, of course, who has a cassette player to play right. cassettes? Sure. Um, I think we assumed it was like radio spots, like ads for D&D &D that we know uh -huh. were um, aired in some markets. And it wasn't until I actually got a cassette deck and played it and found out what was on it that I realized, oh, my God, this is something really different. And you got really excited, didn't you? I did get, I got more and more I would have excited. Kind of excited. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as, as I heard what it was and how they were doing it, and I saw the connection to things like Acquisitions Incorporated and Critical Role, um, that's when I realized there was a big story in this, actually. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's uh, literally, you know, people need, it's linked on my show notes, or people can go to Playing at the World. Uh, let me see, what's your, I've got your blog linked on my, yeah, it's playingattheworld.blogspot.com. It's a D&D &D, D &D syndicated radio show pilot. And it, it's literally, as, as, you ma as you make the case in the video, John, it's obvious that they took notes during actual play sessions and then dramatized it just based on the wacky stuff that was happening, right? Because right, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, nobody would have scripted that. You know, like the guy, <laughs> right. the guy suddenly wanting to use, keep a sturge for a pet, you know, and, and that kind of thing. So... Uh, and, and the other people's puzzlement, like, now you're wanting to do what and why, you know? So um, it, it, it's fast. For me, it's totally fascinating to listen to that. One, like, oh, look what they were trying to do. But two, it's like a time capsule, you know, to go back. And, and, and because if they tried to produce a radio pilot today, it would sound completely different. So it's just bursting with the sensibilities of the time. Right. Does that does that make sense? So uh, it, it, it does. Yeah. And I mean, it, what, what's so great about it, it's such a, a superior ambassador for what it is to play D&D &D yeah. than, say, the cartoon show. Right. The cartoon show that there's the kids, they go through the tunnel of love. thing, Right. They yeah. End up in this land where there's this, you know, short squat, bald dungeon master in the red robe who like tells them what's going on. And I mean, there's really other than than the su most superficial aspects of the setting. It has no relationship to D&D. &D. And what's so compelling about this radio show is that it's it's really the opposite. It shows players yes it's been edited a bit but and there are voice actors who are kind of uh, reading those edited parts but it, it really because it's just the dialogue because you strip it down to just the audio that's like what tabletop is where we have this conversation that conversation is a beating heart of a tabletop role-playing game right um and that that just communicates to you so much more effectively what it's like to play D D and why it's interesting to play it than any of the other media properties they were experimenting with I'll tell you one thing that was interesting that I have no problem with because I grew up with role-playing games and D&Ds 
you know, I know D&D came out in the 70s, <clears throat> but I got involved with role-playing games in the early 80s, was at the very beginning of this radio pilot, the DM says, do you want to go and talk to this guy now, or do you want to wait until the morning? There's no other options offered, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And me, I'm fine with that. But there's people today, they want everything to be so incredibly sandboxy and narrative driven by the players they would chafe at that they'd be like what do you mean why we don't even want to go talk to the guy you know but the but the way that the uh the dm presents it the narrator slash dm they don't have a choice you know that that's their only two choices so uh, yeah it is a little railroady i mean yeah. there are also parts where i think that the dm asks a lot of leading questions like you're talking about the sturge there's a point where one of the other players hates that that, that this player has chosen to get a keep a pet sturge and the dm asks well is there anything you'd like to do yeah, about yeah. That? <laughs> like you know so he asks like leading questions yeah, like he's that stirring and it's, the pot isn't he yeah, well, you, you get the sense, I, I mean, he, he plays a lot like a DM, actually, who's running for people that don't know the game that well. Right, yeah. And, I mean, that could just reflect how, how it was they put this together, or they, right. they or maybe they were thinking they want to, uh, you know, make these choices appear um, a bit, just a bit more, more digestible, right, to an audience that literally doesn't understand the game at all. Right, no, and that's, that's fair enough, because that's what it, I'm sure, it was, it was not only a entertainment product, but a marketing tool, you know, for sure, so... Uh, I'm going to throw some love at a sponsor. We'll take a quick break, come back, and and I want to talk a little bit more about the origins of D&D and and have you pitch your book for us a little bit, that playing at the world. (laughs) Um, Anyway, so we'll come right back here in a second. First, some goblins are your friends. Game Goblins is Central Arkansas's premier retailer of Magic the Gathering, Warhammer 40K, board games, card games, RPGs, miniatures, and hobby accessories. Call Game Goblins at 501-224-GAME or visit them online at GameGoblins.com, conveniently located at 1121 South Bowman, right on the corner of Bowman and Canis in West Little Rock, and staffed by friendly employees, Game Goblins has expanded their store size, and there's plenty of room for exciting inventory and tables for play space. For all your gaming needs, I heartily recommend Game Goblins. Make sure to check out their customer loyalty program that rewards you based on your actual purchases. Game Goblins earns your business and keeps it. First-time customers mention Shane Plays and receive $10 off your purchase of $50 or more. Call Game Goblins at 501-224-GAME or visit them online at GameGoblins.com. Tell them Shane Plays sent you. Comic book lovers, visit TheWildStars.com today. today. From the mind of author and comic book industry expert Michael Tierney, it's not just a comic book, it's a comic book novel. The Wild Stars is sci-fi and so much more. Learn the explanations behind UFOs and space gods. This isn't the Twilight Zone. This is the region of the Milky Way galaxy known as The Wild Stars. We guarantee you've never read anything like it. The complete comic book novel took 20 years to tell, with one reviewer noting, the story of the Wild Stars stretches ambitiously across space and time, from small town murders to the destruction of planets, with every event given multiple layers of meaning. If you haven't read The Wild Stars, you're missing out. Visit thewildstars.com today. Mega Wars Darknet. The classic online space strategy game has returned. Bigger and better than ever before. Scout the universe and claim your empire. Construct, customize, and launch dozens of different starships. Battle thousands of opponents online in a team-based competition leading to the ultimate Battle of the Galaxy. Grab your slot today for the only online game where tactics and strategy still reign supreme. Visit Megawars.net and get options only available in our special pre-sales previews running now. Megawars.net The die is cast. Plunge into worlds of fantastic adventure where dragons lie and the undead stalk the shades of your mind's imagines. Where creatures of legend plunder wealth through the horror of their passage. Monsters grim and foul hold the ecstasy of gold and the renown of glory. 
All this and more awaits you and your friends in the unlimited, fantastic world of the Castles and Crusades role-playing game from Troll Lord Games. Visit your friendly local game store or trolllord.com to get your copy today. A rules-light, adaptable game that has stood the test of time. Twelve years in constant publication with no new additions, Castles and Crusades is the original easy-to-play attribute check system. Join us and unleash your imagination. Visit your friendly local game store or trolllord.com to get your copy of castles and crusades today shame plays radio is blessed to have sponsors and we appreciate them very much however did you know that you can also support the show as an individual for as little as one dollar an episode simply go to patreon.com slash shame plays hey we're back welcome to shame plays geek talk radio a journey into things we love, joined by role playing game slash D and D uh, and fan community historian and scholar John Peterson, who is also the author of a unique and extremely cool book called Playing at the World. So I want to make sure uh, before we wrap, we got roughly eight minutes or so left, John. I want to make sure to talk about your look book a little bit so people because that's how I first came to know about you, and then I got tuned into your blog and that sort of thing. I want to read a couple of quotes from the reviews on Amazon. Um, and then there's this, this people at shameplays.com. This is linked. You can go find this book or you can just go to, you know, search for playing at the world um, to, to find it. So uh, I've got two reviews here. I wanted to highlight. Uh, somebody said, what an amazing book. It immediately becomes the gold standard on the history of role playing and wargaming. I agree with that. I don't know anybody else doing the history of gaming itself. I'm not talking about biographies or but just just documenting everything on the level you are. And then I love this. Uh, at 720 pages in length and weighing in enough to use in case of zombie apocalypse as a bludgeoning tool. <laughs> Did you see that? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. Well, the the point of that is it's 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 in depth. You know, this is a very yeah. in depth book. So, uh, how did how did your initial moment when you were at the British Museum, which I've been to the British Museum, I, li- I had the, uh, you know, the, uh, the blessing, fortunate uh, circumstance to live in England for a couple of years when I was in the Air Force, went to the British Museum more than once. Amazing place. I love the illuminated manuscript room. But mm. how did you, okay, so you see the dice. You're like, wait a minute, that's like an old Roman, Roman D20. That's a polyhedral dice. How did that go from, how does that connect to WoW? So you started doing some research to you wrote a book. Yeah, well, I mean, again, um, the, the insight I had, I guess, at that moment was, was about everything. I started thinking, okay, the, the, the first question I asked was, so who was the first person that rolled a die and used that die to decide a fictional event by, say, comparing it to a table? Right, where some some probabilistic matrix had been used to determine what the odds were of a particular fictional event happening, and so I mean, I, I, WoW certainly builds on on those principles. All games uh, that are in the conflict simulation tradition build on that principle, and so it kind of was initially for me a journey back into deep into intellectual history, deep into the early 19th century, and to the Prussian military theorists who designed the first things we would probably recognize as simulations that have that quality that you use implements of chance, some kind of randomization function to des- decide fictional events that have some probability of occurring. Okay, so I got a question for you. <laughs> yeah. These, you know, these, when you, this classic image of these, you know, uh, Prussian generals or whatever, they're always standing around the war game table and they're pushing their little pieces with their sticks and all that stuff. Do you think that that actually made a difference in battle? Do you think that they, you know, I mean, did that did did do you have any evidence that that they saw more success in battle after doing that kind of thing well so there there's a famous um fam- famously people thought they did whether or not it's actually true is a, another another well, question they still entirely, do it today after like, you know they still have war gaming today you know in military oh, they service. do yeah yeah and we could, we could talk about the whole kind of you know uh actual uh, professional military tradition of war gaming as well as the hobby tradition and kind of when they bifurcated and what what different choices they made as they went down their respective paths but i mean what, what you'd say about that particular question is around like the 1860s the prussians hadn't been much 
involved in war in the previous decades. And then kind of in the 1860s and then early 1870s, they had a number of just spectacular high-profile victories. And this led to a lot of consternation, actually, in in European military circles as people asked, why was it the Prussians were able to dominate powers like France? I mean, France was the big one, obviously, they took on in 1871, like that, you know, from being a peacetime army, as far as we could tell. And what people lighted on, whether it was true or not, was this tradition of conflict simulation, was this tradition Mm. of wargaming and of understanding Ending. Um, I mean, again, they, they, they understood war like it was one of the physical sciences, like it was predictable, mm. like if you built an accurate enough model that you'd be able to figure out what was going to happen. Mm. And this inspired people. And the interesting thing about it, again, it, maybe it's entirely mythical, right? But, but it was the subject of a great deal of um, literature in the 1870s in England. And people like Robert Louis Stevenson read that. And Stevenson, who is famous to us, of course, is the author of, of Treasure Island, of uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Mm-hmm. He read that and decided, I want to try to make a fun game out of that. And so in the early 1880s, um, he was in poor health. He was living in Switzerland in a, a sanatorium, basically. Right. Um, you know, he holed up in the attic of this chalet and designed these massive war games using toy soldiers. And the reports of his activities in that regard informed then H.G. Wells, who published a book called Little Wars. Came yeah, out in, I remember, uh, yeah, I think I know about that because of you, actually. Um, could be. It's a pretty yeah. famous book, though. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of the first book of like hobby wargaming in yeah. the early 20th century. And it, it inspired all the kind of mini, miniature wargaming that followed up and through the, the 1950s and 1960s. Which in turn so, led to Chainmill, which in turn led to Dungeons and Dragons, which in turn led to all this other wow. stuff. So which is why <laughs> yes. your book is a history of simulating wars, people and fast from fantastic adventures from trust to role playing games. Um let me, and I hate to, I've got to, we got about two minutes left here. I wanted to get one last question in. Um, am I, am I right in recalling that actually a lot of D and D and, and, and some of that came from an old baseball simulator game? Did I read that somewhere? Did I read that in your book or there was like a statistical game that people used to play that seemed remarkably similar to initial role-playing games for simulating baseball? Yeah, there's a game called Stratomatic Baseball, That's which it. That's rolled it. Yeah. Um, 3D6 to determine the outcomes of uh, particular at-bats and things like that. And a lot of the people who, who collect and study this do study that as well. I'm not sure I'd go out on a limb and say that it was the main thing that informed it. I'd say that that was part of a very broad set of um, games that were, were simulating, right, uh, the behavior of individual actors in a game at the time. Uh, I would equally well single out things like Fight in the Skies, which was a, a, a World War I uh, dogfight simulator uh-huh. um, that was focused on individual pilots. I mean, it, there, there were so many of these influences. I, I wouldn't say that Stratomatic would ne- was necessarily the decisive one. Okay, I'm glad to get your opinion on that because I'm pretty sure I've read stuff that were like basically basically saying without Stratomatic, we wouldn't have had Gary Gygax doing D&D. You know, I, I think I've read stuff to that level. So um, playing at the world, the music means we're, we got about a minute left. Uh, playing at the world by John Peterson. John, I wish I could talk to you all day, man. This is a treat. Do you <laughs> have any, fun. do you have any final thoughts uh, that you'd like to share or anything that you're doing? Like, what can we expect from you next? Um, well, like I said, I'm working on a number of different projects, some related to computers. I'm doing one related to monsters. I'm doing um, – what one thing actually it's probably worth mentioning since we talked about the, uh, the D&D radio show – is that um, I have been talking to Wizards about that, and it is likely that Wizards will be able to make the entire thing available. Ooh, that would be public. cool. Yeah, because we only got to hear select ep- excerpts with, with your commentary. So, yeah, I love your stuff. Every time I see something drop from, from your Twitter, like Docetist, is it Docetist or Docetist? <laughs> you can say Dose. <laughs> okay, Docetist. Uh, I always get excited because I know it's going to be good. So, anyway, I got to wrap us. John, thanks so much for being on. Uh, hope to get to talk to you again in the future. And people, we will uh, check you next time on Shane Plays Geek Talk Radio. Let's quickly and meticulously proceed on. Well, what are we going to do with this trapped Sturge, for heaven's sake? Oh, carry it for a while. I will try to tame it. On that note, the Sturge wakes up. Isn't it supposed to sleep for eight hours? Well, I, I guess it wasn't. Oh, yes! Now what are you going to do with that thing? I mean, where are you going to put it? I'm going to hold it for a while as I ride on my horse. Meticulously and carefully. So all of you proceed for an hour or two, and twilight turns to dark. Is it nighttime? That's what usually happens when it gets dark. 
and you set up camp once again for the night very cautiously. Are we out of the trees? You're out of the trees. Oh, yay, no more trees. In fact, within a mere hour or two of travel, if you wish to do it at night in this rugged terrain, which I doubt is the very peak which you seek. Uh, not me. I don't want to travel any more today. In fact, I don't want to travel anywhere with that blasted bird. I don't like that bird. So you set up for the night. Uh, do you wish to take any specific action regarding the release of that bird? Well, I mean, I think I just want to kill that bird. Well, I keep an eye on the bird to make you feel easier about it, Ears. But I'm afraid I'll be consumed in my prayers. Well, the bird is not a vastly entertaining show, either. Otherwise, I'd be glad to do it. I I just don't have the strength in me. Doesn't anyone like my bird? Oh, we just have more important things to do. Like sleep, for example. But uh, we will take turns keeping watch. Shame Plays Radio is blessed to have sponsors, and we appreciate them very much. However, did you know that you can also support the show as an individual? For as little as $1 an episode, simply go to patreon.com slash shameplay. 